Um, so our next speaker is going to talk about uh, his experiences as a refugee lawyer and in front of the Refugee Protection Division, um, and is going to concentrate especially on, I think we titled it, Mastering the Art of a Redirect. Um, so Lee Cohen is the founder and chair emeritus of the Halifax Refugee Clinic and continues to act as the clinic's senior counsel. He's also a part founder and chair of the New Brunswick Refugee Clinic. I looked, I, I saw you looking at me there. Um, he's a practicing immigration lawyer in Halifax, and as many here will know, he's a frequent and tireless uh, advocate for refugees in Nova Scotia. Lee graduated from Dalhousie University Law School in 1980 and became a Queen's Counsel in 2002. He began his law career practicing criminal and family law, but soon found his true calling as an immigration lawyer after volunteering to help represent 174 Sikh asylum seekers who arrived by boat on Nova Scotia's shores in 1987. He has many good stories about that, but he'll have to regale us another time. Lee began taking on immigration cases on a full-time basis, often working pro bono since there were many people who desperately needed help with their immigration cases, but lacked options for free legal representation in Nova Scotia. Lee worked out of his own home for years in order to keep his overhead costs low. In 2000, Lee Cohen established the Halifax Refugee Clinic as a nonprofit pro bono clinic, which continues after almost two decades to provide free legal and settlement services for people claiming refugee status in Nova Scotia. Today, Lee Cohen and his colleagues at M. Lee Cohen and Associates are solely dedicated to handling matters related to immigration, refugees, and human rights. Lee has addressed many public and private organizations on immigration, refugees, discrimination, and racism, and is a frequent media commentator on these issues locally and nationally, and a very good personal friend, and kind of our guru at the clinic. So thank you so much, Lee, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. I started doing uh, refugee work. Nobody else was doing refugee work. That's an expression of how old I am, I, I guess. Um, it's also an expression of how the world has evolved. Um, uh, Peter and I were saying just briefly uh, before we got started this morning that um, who would have thought um, so many years ago when we were doing refugee claims back then Peter was a board member at that time, and I was trying to figure it all out. Uh, who would have thought back then that this many years later, uh, the need for refugee lawyers would be greater than it was then? Um, and who would have thought when we got the refugee clinic up and running over 18 years ago, that 18 years later, it would be busier now than it was then? Uh, the whole idea of starting it then was to... Uh, solve a problem that existed at that time and get it solved and then allow us all to just kind of move on with our lives. And in fact, it has become our lives because of the, um, the way things evolve in the world. And uh, we all know all too well that things seem to be moving in a very um, ominous and dark way uh, at the moment in the world, not just in the world over there, but in the world over here. And uh, so, it, it uh, I am very pleased to see that the number of people who are involved in this kind of work, um, that there are people who are prepared to get involved in this kind of work. Uh, one of the one of the things that I've been able to accomplish, in fact, it's a skill that I've honed extremely well in my life, is to be able to work really, really hard at this and not make any money at it. <laughs> and uh, so you should know that going in. And uh, I thank you all for being able to um, for being willing to. Uh, make that kind of sacrifice um, there's always a tension in lawyers about um, what kind of practice they're going to engage in and what kind of life they're going to live and uh, um, oftentimes uh, lawyers are um, influenced by uh, very lofty and very affluent concepts and uh, see great riches for themselves at some point in their careers and uh, people who choose this kind of work, certainly in this part of the country, I'm not so sure what it's like in the larger centers, but in this, um, in this part of the country, one doesn't do this work because one wants to live a lavish lifestyle. There are, there are higher priorities and higher callings. And uh, um, I'm very pleased to see that this room is full uh, for this particular occasion, and I hope the room will continue to be full for the rest of the workshops that the clinic is orchestrating. Um, 
I open my comments with that um, in part because um, it's true. Um, and also to give you a bit of um, an example of how I think advocates should approach conducting refugee hearings. If, if you don't, at a refugee hearing, if you don't leave a piece of yourself behind at the hearing, you haven't quite done your job. You won't hear that kind of commentary from most litigation lawyers. Um, we're not taught that in law school. In fact, we're taught something quite different. Um, we're taught to have that kind of um, uh, professional distance from the case professional distance from the client uh, in order to maintain that very essential objectivity that you need in order to give good legal counsel. And that generally is a good uh, construct. Uh, and I, I, I don't do much litigation outside of the refugee and immigration context, so um, that probably is a good idea in those contexts. But it never should. But it was never a good idea for me in the, in the immigration and refugee context. Um, this is different work. Uh, it's different um, in every possible way that I can think of. And when I was listening to Peter earlier talk about the theory of the case, I kept thinking of cases that I've worked on or thinking of cases that I'm currently working on and um, reminding myself that this is unlike any other work uh, that a lawyer can do. And, and therefore, it requires a different approach and a different way of thinking about it and a different way of thinking about what your role is uh, as a refugee lawyer, as a refugee advocate. I, one of the tensions is that you do have to keep some distance. We all know from our own personal lives that we advise our friends about things a whole lot differently than we would advise our clients about the very same things. And, and we, have to, we do have to keep some distance. You can't get swallowed into it. But then you become uh, um, of less value to, to your client. But you have to find that sweet spot, that perfect place where you can be both advocate and the person to whom your refugee client, your claimant, is looking to for just about everything that they need to look to to save their life. And that's a pretty tall order, and it's a very onerous responsibility, and most lawyers don't have that in, in the work that they do. There are all kinds of other tensions. The stakes are high in different kinds of ways, in different kinds of cases, in various areas of litigation, but there are very few areas of law. Maybe there are no areas of law. In Canada, we don't have capital punishment, so there really is no other area in law in Canada where if you don't do your job the way it needs to be done, or if you lose your case, your fault or not, um, there's a very serious possibility that your client will be returned to their country of origin and killed. It's kind of bleak, but it's true. And um, so other lawyers don't have that kind of tension when they go into a file, when they decide to take a client or not take a client. When we take a client in a refugee matter, we have to think very seriously about what's the end game. What's this going to look like at the end if things don't go well? There are various stages of preparation in a refugee claim. There's the theory of the case, deciding what are the issues, how am I going to approach them? There's the writing stage, which in my opinion is unbelievably important, more so in a refugee claim than it is in maybe any other area of litigation. Um, there's the client preparation, preparing the claimant to testify. And then there's the role of the lawyer in the hearing. Uh, in the old days, the role of the lawyer was much more pronounced and much more obvious and more consistent with other areas of litigation in the old days, lawyers led. Like in any, in any normal courtroom litigation scenario, the case would be started and the, um, we would start to question our client doing what we would call a direct examination. 
board members could intervene at any time if they had questions. Some did a lot. Some didn't do it much. Um, and then the rules changed. And the role of the lawyer got marginalized. The role of the lawyer was pushed to the sidelines. All of a sudden, direct examination was being done by the person making the decision, which is a weird concept for a lawyer. Um, that's, not, that's not litigation normal. And once, once the lawyer's role in the hearing was relegated essentially to trying to clean up a mess, um, it, it, it necessarily changes how we approach the whole, the whole thing. If I can do direct examination in my hearing, then I set the stage. I decide what the props are going to be. I decide who the players are going to be. I even decide most of the dialogue for the play. And then after I'm done doing my job, if I've done it well and comprehensively, the judge or the board member will intervene and do whatever he or she thinks that they have to do to get us to the end of the hearing. Uh, but I've set the stage. I've set the tone of the hearing. I've set the mood. I've decided what the issues were, what was really important. I've decided what I wanted to exploit in the hearing, what I wanted to back away from. I was the director. That's no longer true. That hasn't been true for a while now. Now the board member takes the lead. The board member does the direct examination. And lawyers have been left trying to figure out how to make themselves useful in, the new, in, in what was then the new refugee world, refugee process, uh, hearing world. And having worked with uh, new lawyers and volunteers at the refugee clinic, and having worked with um, lawyers who have from time to time worked in my office, you get to see um, where some of the concerns are, where some of the weaknesses are. <coughs> In the new regime, it's not really that new anymore, but I still call it the new regime. In the new hearing regime, the lawyer has two um, roles to play. There are two areas in the hearing where the lawyer must, must stand up and be counted. One is in what we call the redirect examination. We step in after the board member has done whatever he or she thinks needed to be done. And then there's the final submission. And what I was observing, and uh, Julie and I have talked about this from time to time, um, what, what we are observing um, is the tension, the apparent tension that exists in lawyers, new and not so new, about whether to even ask a question at all. There's this perception that the board member, well, they know what they're doing. Uh, they do these cases every day of the week, and uh, they're, uh, you know, for the most part, they're thorough. and. Uh, I sat and I listened to the board member ask my client uh, question after question after question for two or three hours. I, I think they've covered it all, and uh, I'm not feeling too good about how the hearing is going. Uh, and, and then there's that moment where the board member says to counsel, counsel, do you have any questions? And so all of a sudden, there's this kind of sinking feeling in your chest, oh God, now what do I do? Uh, what do I ask? The board member's covered everything. Um, at least I think they've covered everything. Uh, I don't want to mess the case up. I, I, I don't. It, it's a, it's an, it's an insecure moment for a lawyer. When we have the chance to do direct, we direct the show, and then we can do redirect later to clean up whatever whatever it is we think needed to be cleaned up. But now it's all different. Now the board members running the entire show. And um, what we're observing, what we think we're observing, is that. Um, lawyers are very often conceding all or some of the case to the board member by not taking, by not seizing the opportunity to try to address things that occurred in the hearing that need to get addressed. One, you've got to identify, you've got to recognize, uh, recognize where something has gone off the rails. And, and then you've got to make the decision that you're going to do something about it, and then you've got to think about, well, how do I do it? And uh, far too often, and this is going to sound particularly peculiar coming from a lawyer, but far too often, lawyers are mired down in the um, in the um, in the habits and the tendencies of most lawyers to be unwilling to kind of just let it go. What do I mean by that? Um, 
I have often believed that there are two courses that need to be taught in law school that, to the best of my knowledge, are not taught in any law school, although I've never researched this. One is creative writing, and two is improvisational drama. <laughs> and um, thank you so much, because I can't get anyone to agree with me on this. Um, I actually did mention it to the dean of our law school here and said, there's two courses missing, and I named the two courses, and she looked at me, well, that's interesting, and uh, said that maybe we'll do something about that, and that was some time ago. And I don't believe there are any such courses. And why do I think that? Number one, when I read people's writing, it is good lawyerish writing. But the refugee claim is not your standard lawyerish process. It requires it requires it requires you to get outside of your stiff self and kind of loosen up a little bit in your brain and in your body and start to behave in a way that convinces somebody of about something that needs to be done. Most of us are trained to identify facts, to state them in a concise, precise, um, sophisticated way um, in order to satisfy a judge in a court. This is what we're trained to do, and most, you know, most people go to law school and graduate are intellectually capable people and academically gifted and can usually get that done well. But in the, in the refugee context, to a lesser degree in the immigration context, but to a larger degree in the refugee context, it just isn't good enough, in my years of experience, it just isn't good enough to say the things that need to be said. You need to convince somebody about something here. You need to persuade somebody about something here. And just laying out the facts in a refugee context doesn't do that. You need to say something in a way that causes the person who's gonna read the material you're writing to say, I get it. Not only do I get it, I feel it. Not only do I feel it, I wanna do something about it. And if we resort to just regular lawyer writing, we're not gonna take the decision maker, the reader of that material to the point where we need to take them. Remember one thing, that in a refugee hearing, your client, the refugee claimant, is guilty and to prove an innocent. Now, no one, no one says it that way because that's just abhorrent to us as a uh, you know, free democratic society in, a uh, in, in, the, in our legal regime. But the fact of the matter is, we have to go into a hearing and prove refugeeness. And, and, and unless we do it, we lose the case. I remember a conversation that you and I had, I think maybe in 2001 or 2002, when you helped me realize that what I'm doing in closing in a refugee hearing, I'm not talking to a judge, I'm talking to a jury. If this is that. So what, we, what, what a lawyer has to do at that moment where the board member says, counsel, do you want to ask any questions? Counsel has to do some very fast thinking. And the thinking you have to go through is, do I need to change the context of this hearing? Do I need to change the mood of the room? Do I need to um, move the judge from where I, uh, I keep using the word judge, do I need to move the board member from where I think the board member is to where I think the board member needs to go? Has the board member ruined my case by asking a whole bunch of questions that once answered by my client is still missing context? These are the, these are the kind of, uh, has the board member gotten it wrong? Or even more worryingly, more frighteningly, frighteningly, has the claimant got it wrong? Has the claimant got the answers wrong? The question may have been fair, but the answer may have been may have been wrong. And you know, because you've worked so hard with the claimant and you've prepped so much with the claimant, you know that the claimant knows that the answer to that question was the wrong answer, and you know the claimant has the right answer, and you need to give enough the claimant an opportunity to fix that problem. These things happen. They happen time and time again, hearing in and hearing out. And so what you need as a practitioner, as an advocate for refugee, uh, refugee claimant, is you need to have the internal personal confidence to identify what's really going on and be prepared to stand outside the normal behavior of a, of, of a lawyer and say, I gotta get angry about this. I've gotta show some emotion about this. 
I have to stop behaving the way I've been trained to behave and start to feel that in a few moments, if I don't do something very important here, there's going to be a rejection of this claim and my client's going back to who knows where to face who knows what. It's hugely important. One of the reasons why I believe that improvisational drama is an important part of a lawyer's dream is because lawyers are very, very good at kind of doing what I'm doing right now. Standing up, going to the board, item number one, item number two, item number three. If all three exist, then we move to the next stage of the process. In, in a refugee context, you just have to get a whole bunch looser than that. You just got to start, you've got to start, uh, you've got to start feeling the case. You've got to start feeling the tension. You've got to start feeling the anger. You've got to start acting on all of that. And you've got to start to perform. You really do. Uh, too much theatrics will not be will not be well received. I'm not talking about being theatrical. I'm talking about being able to think outside outside the normal outside the normal box. Being able to write outside the normal box. Every one of the, everything that I've ever read by any lawyer who's written anything on, on a, in a narrative for a refugee claim has said what needed to be said, but has not said it in a way that makes me makes me believe that the case is going to be successful. And the same is true when we're at the, when we're actually at the hearing room at the at the council table. There's a requirement to know when to lean in, and I mean literally, lean in. Really put your hand on your fist on your on your on your chin and get serious about this. There's a need to know when to pull back, and I mean literally pull back. There's a need to know when your voice needs to be raised. There's a need to know when your voice needs to start to fall back. There's a need to know when to, how to use voice inflection. There's a need to know how to use body language. How am I going to present myself? There's a need to, there's a need to do some performance here because all of these are your tools. And your claimant, your client, is relying on you to know these tools and to utilize them well in order to get the claimant to the place where the claimant needs to go. And I see far too often too many young lawyers and not so young lawyers um, get stuck in the hearing, um, relying on their personal internal perception of what the role of a lawyer is in the litigation context and not taking advantage of all of the other tools available to human beings in every other context of life that are so important to trying to convince somebody about something. Don't allow the formality of the room or the formality of the process to getting in the way of being a human being. Because it's, refugee claims are very much human being to human being to human being. Claimant, council, board member. Board member, council, claimant, we're all in it together. I think that we need to get a brave in a couple of areas where I see council not being brave. Number one, there are moments in um, uh, in the process when council has an opportunity to examine a claimant, to um, really, really examine the claimant. And by that, I mean do a little cross-examination on your own client. It's so counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive for us as, as practitioners. It's also counterintuitive to the board member. Many cases, many claimants will come to a case. Let me let me reshape that. Very few claimants uh, will come to a case where there isn't something about their history, or something about their story, or something about the story they've told you that isn't quite right, isn't quite honest, or isn't consistent with something else they've said to somebody else in officialdom that is now a document or an exhibit at a hearing. It's counterintuitive for us to start to challenge our own our own clients when they're on the stand. It's not, it's not normal co uh, courtroom context concepts. But I have found it to be particularly useful on, in the area of credibility. And we all know in a refugee context, credibility is huge. That narrative is huge. That written narrative is huge. The next hugest thing is the credibility of the claimant. Those two things alone can win or lose a case. And so credibility is constant on constantly on display and constantly being assessed and adjudicated. And 
If in the hearing context, the claimant says something that we know is not consistent with something that got said somewhere else, and maybe the board member has picked up on it, maybe the board member hasn't picked up on it, but you have, and you know that the decision is in almost all likelihood going to be a reserve decision, and the board member is going to go back to his or her office somewhere and really read this stuff, and it's going to see the inconsistency, and it's going to come back to haunt us at a later point. So don't let it come back to haunt us. Don't give the board member that opportunity. Don't give the board member that ammunition. If something has gone off the rails in the hearing, make sure that you examine the claimant on exactly what has gone off the rails. If the claimant has lied, either in some aspect of the paperwork, or if the claimant has lied at the hearing, and you know, and you know the claimant knows, then you need to take the claimant through that. You need to say to the claimant, Mr. So-and-so, earlier in your testimony, you said A, B, C, and D. In your narrative, it seems to suggest A, B, C, and D may not quite be right. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? And the claimant will go, yes. And it's my understanding, Mr. Claimant, that A, B, C, and D probably is not how this occurred, but E, F, and G. This is my understanding from your narrative. I mean, you've got to tie it in. You can't be making, you can't be giving evidence yourself. You've got to tie it into something. And so I'm saying to the claimant, I think it's E, F, and G. What do you say about that? And the claimant will go, it's not A, B, C, and D. In your prep work with your claimant, you need to remind the claimant of his or her own humanness. You need to remind the claimant that we all make mistakes. That making a mistake is a human thing to do, and you will make a mistake in the hearing. It's an unbelievably intense process where so much is at stake, and we're asking the claimant to do so much in a short period of time that we can't possibly expect them to perform 100% for every minute that they're in a hearing. And so you need to remind the claimant that if this goes wrong, stay relaxed. I will identify it. I will know that it's gone wrong. And I'm going to take you back to the moment of wrongness, and I'm going to bring you forward from there. But I can't do it if I don't ask the questions. I can't do it if I abandon the opportunity to do a redirect of my client. I must do the redirect. I cannot let the moment pass. And so the prep work with the claimant is, what I'm illustrating here is the importance of the prep work with the claimant. The claimant has to trust you. The claimant has to trust you to know what to do when it needs to be done. And the claimant has to trust you to have the skills to take the claimant from the moment of wrongness or badness to something better right through the hearing. And so you have to say to the claimant in your prep work, please don't try to figure out what I'm trying to do with my question. Please don't decide in your own head where I'm going with this, because you don't know, number one. Hopefully you do know yourself. But what I've seen time and time again is claimants saying to themselves, you can see it happening. I see where he's going with this question. Well, I'm going to work with him on this. No, don't work with me. There's only the answer to the question. There's only the truth or not the truth. There's only yes or no. It's either a truth or a lie. Don't work with me on this. Just answer my question. And trust me to take you where you need to go. And if you don't have that rapport with your client well before you walk into the hearing room, then this is particularly difficult to do. Don't figure out where I'm going with my question. Just answer the question, and I will lead you to where you need to go. But that requires lots of prep work. That requires building the trust with the claimant, which is particularly difficult to do in a refugee context, because many refugees come from situations where trusting somebody would have cost them their lives. Refugees come from contexts where lying saved their lives. And all of a sudden, they come to this country, from that country, from that system to this system, and you're expecting them to shift gears very quickly, and all of a sudden, accept that I, as an officer of the court, as a lawyer in a country where lawyers have unique responsibilities, that I am independent. You have to convince them that that's the case, and that you are going to be 
uh, safe relying on me. It's tough in the refugee context. Some people are so broken that it can't, it can't be done. And you need to recognize that too. And somehow you have to figure out a way through that. I mean, that's your role. And that's what I mean when I say, don't stay so distant. Don't stay so distant from the claimant that you can't see that. Or if you do see that, that you don't or can't do something about it, you've got to do something about it. The purpose of doing the redirect examination is to fix things. The board member has read the materials. The board member comes into the hearing with a, a context. The board member comes into the hearing maybe with a relative, maybe with a decision forming in the board member's head that may not be favorable. And that will become evident. I did a hearing uh, two months ago. Chago and I are working on a hearing right now, on a, on a judicial review of a hearing right now. We did this hearing in Toronto about two months ago, where the board member make it, made it perfectly clear, very early in the hearing, about where she stood on this case. And uh, it was a position we did not want her to take. It was a place we did not want her to be. And um, and this board member was particularly scripted. Uh, the questions were all on a laptop computer on the table and question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. And then when that was done and, 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 and enough tension was created in the room where the claimant felt particularly apprehensive um, it was not quite a hostile environment, but we were in that path. We were on that path. We were in that direction. Um, board member said, "Counsel, um, if you have any questions, you can question uh, your client if you wish. Uh, I will let you know that I think this and I don't think that." And I said to the board member, "Do I understand, then, uh, Madam Board Member, that um, you have now made a finding?" And I want to nail the board member down on that. I want to know: Is this your finding? Because if this is your finding, and she knows, and I know, and we both know, that if this is your finding, we're going to court. And the board member refused to say that it was a finding. It was a finding, but she didn't want to use that kind of language. And so it became very clear to me that if the hearing ends now, we're, we're going to lose. And, um, and we're going to end up in front of a federal court. So I had to do something. I had to, I had to make my moves. The mood of the room had shifted so dramatically from the moment the hearing started to that point in time in the hearing that it seemed a, mere, it seemed a near impossibility to create the shift that I said is so important that counsel <coughs> needs, to, needs to create. Uh, the client had become, the claimant had become so apprehensive and so emotionally distraught that um, she, uh, I think that she fell apart. Um, Palestinian woman, uh, very accomplished in the country where she was raised, um, very capable in English, although we did use a translator. In prep, was very, very impressive. At the hearing, not so much so. And so we're in a hostile room, apprehensive claimant, claimant falls apart. Somehow we have to try to resurrect that. And that, that is our responsibility as, as counsel doing redirect. We have to figure out a way to take us from a moment of badness to that moment where the hearing has gone off the rails and try to bring, it, bring the case to the case that we want to present. I will finish off with this. There is an automatic tension between counsel and the decision maker. It's just in the system. The decision maker thinks that this is her case. As counsel, I know that this is my case. And I'm not conceding my case to you, Madam Board Member, in the same way that you're not conceding the case to me. 
and this is a constant tension in refugee hearings. It's a tension in, in, in all litigation contexts, but it's particularly important in the refugee context. Don't give it up. Don't let it go. Remember who you're representing. <coughs> Remember the consequences of losing. If you're going to lose, and, you know, to resort to cliches, if you're going to lose, go down swinging with everything that you've got. One of the very first lessons I learned as a lawyer and my first year of practice over there across the harbor was from a senior, the senior lawyer in the firm, a guy named Robert Hustis, who's no longer with us. And I was doing a criminal trial, and my guy was very guilty, and very guilty. And um, we had done all of the evidence, and then there was a break for lunch, and uh, we're going to come back and do final submissions. And I went back to the office, and I said to Mr. Hustis, it, it, it ain't going well. Everybody in that courtroom knows that we're guilty. I know my client's guilty. The prosecutor knows my client's guilty. I think the prosecutor has proven that my client's guilty. The judge knows the client's guilty. And more worryingly for me, the judge knows that I know the client's guilty. And so what do, what do you do? What do you do in that situation? Um, how do I maintain my personal integrity and my credibility I'll be, be appearing in front of this judge countless times over the years. How do I go in front of this person and say, Judge, my guy's not guilty? And uh, Mr. Hughes has said to me, quite simply, Lee, when your guy's sitting in prison after the conviction is entered, the one thing that he's got to be, the one thing that he's got to know and be confident about is that you did everything you possibly could do for him before the judge rendered a decision. So you go in there and you fight the fight that needs to be fought. I did. We lost. He went to prison. But he went to prison uh, knowing that we didn't give it up. And when he was finally out of prison and, and um, re-offended, he hired me again. So, <laughs> so I guess that's, that's the good side of the story. I thank you all for being patient, uh, hearing what I have to say. The bottom line here is don't let the board member take your case away from you. Never forget the stakes that are, uh, that are at risk in a refugee hearing, and don't not seize the opportunity to do what you think needs to be done in a hearing that you feel in your guts and you know in your brain is not going the way it needs to go. Use every opportunity you have to try to get it back, get the case back, and try to win the case. Thank you. Okay, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you ask a question, please be very loud. Sure. Um, what has been your, your experience in trying to intervene during the board member's questioning? So if you, for example, I had one where uh, I felt like the claimant really misunderstood the question. Let's say if I was, tell, tell me about the incident that happened during university, but the answer was really about what happened during high school. So I, I said, you know, I asked, my, I asked the witness to stop speaking, and I said, I think I misunderstood the question. Was your question about high school or about university? And then the board member clarified the question. And, um, but I, I've always done that very sparingly. But what has been your experience about just trying to intervene during the board member's questions when things are going awry? I have a theory. If I don't understand the question, I assume my client didn't understand the question. So I ask board members to repeat. And that's particularly true when you're going through a translator, because that happens a lot. That's point one. Point number two, if the question is just wrong, then I do. I do intervene, and you do it. Of course, you do it politely and professionally. Uh, Madam board member, you asked uh, blah blah blah. University, uh, is it possible that you meant high school? And the board member, and and almost always, a board member will say yes. Counsel, thank you very much for that, and 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 get it straight. So yes, intervene. Don't let something that's going wrong continue to go wrong. If you if you if you see it, fix it. Very quickly, Lee. What um, what did you do to change the mood? in that last hearing that you just described? Um, you went from uh, a room filled with tension? Um, just to show you that I'm human too, um, I didn't do a very good job. Um, Tiago, who had the opportunity to listen to the whole hearing on a, on a, on a disc because we're preparing for federal court on it, uh, probably speak about this better than I. He, uh, I was... Um, I was quite dissatisfied at the end of it all with everybody, including myself. 
Um, but what I did do was I made sure that we got out on the table everything that I thought needed to be said. And uh, so I didn't lose the opportunity for the witness to, for, I'm sorry, for the claimant to try to uh, resurrect the case that we thought we were going to be making in the first place. Unfortunately, the board member didn't. It, it, the, the case turned on a very complicated legal issue, not factual. And the, and the board member said, look, this is my view of it, and I think you're wrong. And so it didn't almost didn't matter what we what we had to say. Um, if I could just intervene. Uh, so what I heard when I listened to it um, is that when you do have that unreasonable board member who has already made that finding, what you do is you pin them down for review for at the IAD, at the uh, RAD, or at federal courts. And I think we did that by making sure that are you making a finding? You know, just asking that to see that if it, to make sure that the transcript does have something that is reviewable. That it is clear from the transcript that the board member was being unreasonable. And we'll be we'll be relying on that when we eventually get into the search. Sort of no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great.